Hello and welcome to another Debating Europe Citizens panel uh, and I'm joined here with a panel of citizens to discuss uh, what the future of democracy should look like in the 21st century. We're going to have a little debate here, we're going to have a discussion about democracy, some ideas, some questions that we might have and then the, the output of this will go into a panel, an expert panel that we will be publishing on the 1st of March bringing together uh, kind of a, a group of um, experts in participative and deliberative democracy to to discuss and respond and react to some of the, the discussion that we have here. But first, maybe I can um, get maybe I can get participants to, to introduce themselves. I'll go round and I also want to ask the, the kind of big picture question, what should democracy look like in the 21st century to kind of um, to set the, the scene and then we'll go into this discussion. I should introduce myself first. My name is Joe Litabaski. I'm the editor in chief of Debating Europe. Um, I'll hand over to, to Martin and perhaps Martin, you can just quickly introduce yourself and then uh, answer the, the question very big picture. What do you think? What are your ideas about democracy and how you think it should look in the 21st century? Thanks, Joe. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, indeed, my name is Martin de Groot, pronouns he, him. Um, who am I? I'm a Dutch citizen living in Germany, uh, in the south of Germany. Um, I've been quite interested in the question of, of democracy and in particular how to organize democracy across borders, knowing that power and money interests and so forth are more and more organized across borders. I think also the question of how, how can we organize democracy across borders has, has really intrigued me. Uh, also in particular since the, the referendum in the Netherlands in 2005 on the constitutional treaty, uh, the European constitutional treaty, which was a no. <laughs> um, yeah, and maybe then to immediately jump to your question, uh, what should democracy look like in the 21st century? Um, well, from my perspective, what it should look like is, um, is to have political systems in which those most marginalized in society are at the center instead of being excluded and further marginalized because of the political system itself. Um, I'm afraid that too often also so-called democratic innovations, they claim to be innovative, they claim to be new, they claim to be inclusive, um, but those so-called democratic innovations also in the context of the Conference on the Future of Europe, they keep on excluding and further marginalizing already marginalized com communities. And I think that um, sort of proper collective intelligence, which I think is connected to the question of democracy, um, we can only properly top, tap into collective intelligence if we really learn how to, how to learn from people who experience oppression in, in many different and intersecting ways. That would be my nutshell answer. Thank you, Martin. That is music to my ears. I love, I'm very interested in the in the idea of collective intelligence and also cognitive diversity and how that can kind of best be, be leveraged. And can I just, before I hand over to, to Cleopatra, um, can I just ask you, when you say, you know, you're a bit skeptical of kind of you know, some of these innovations, these democratic innovations, are you are you talking about things like, um, and we might get into this, like citizens assemblies and, and these sort of ideas, or did you have other, other things in mind? I am also talking about these. Um, I mean, they are indeed presented as the most inclusive thing ever. <laughs> um, but I do think that they can very well and often are used rather to divide and rule, basically as an instrument to divide and rule the people rather than truly to empower people and those most marginalized in particular. Fascinating. Okay, we will definitely get into that. I'm sure that citizens assemblies will come over will come up. Uh, first, Cleopatra, perhaps you could introduce yourself um, and then also answer the kind of big picture question. What are your ideas on democracy and, and how it should look in the in the 21st century? Hello, everybody. My name is Cleopatra Modizzi, and I am from Greece. I'm currently also based in Greece. And um, I work as a development associate as a grants and partnerships officer in a local Greek NGO that helps marginalized populations. However, today I'm not uh, representing the organization. I'm speaking on myself and every view that I express, every opinion that I express is my own and it doesn't reflect the opinion of the organization that I work for. Um, so um, besides that, to answer your question, Joe, I think that there's certainly something to be said about the digital platforms that allow us all to communicate uh, across borders. 
I um, I read a little bit about it. I know that direct democracy would be way too chaotic in today's time and age, but I am curious to see kind of how these technologies influence decision making and the ability of people to participate in the democratic process. Um, in general, I think that a lot of people have grown a little bit disillusioned with the way democracies have evolved because we seem, it seems like political leaders and party leaders don't always represent kind of what the people want. And there seems to be this kind of fracture between the masses and the people who uh, lead political parties and are at the center of policymaking. So I'm hoping that these new technologies and mass movements that we've seen in the past, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement or the Me Too movement that's kind of taken over globally, um, I'm hoping that these types of popular mass movements will help uh, influence policymaking in a way that will, like Martin said, uh, present a more holistic view of society. Because um, I think another important element of today's democracy is that we, are, we realize that some people don't get the same opportunities that we do. Uh, we, they don't get the same um, access to rights that we do. And this is something that upsets a lot of people, myself included. I want everybody to have the same chance at um, a good life, whatever that may entail. Um, thank you. That's perfect. Thank you, Cleopatra, because I think you've brought up some really important um, ideas, which are going to, I'm sure, play a role in, in the discussion, uh, including the role of technology. And, and um, this is something which greatly interests me personally. I'm also very acutely aware of the, some of the, uh, you know, the challenges in terms of uh, access to technology um, and the kind of the, the digital divide and how it can be uh, an opportunity, but also potentially exclusionary. So that's something which is really, really kind of important to, to discuss. And then also this idea about mass popular movements and, and the role they might play. You also said, um, and then I'll hand over to Paula, but one kind of quick question for you maybe, um, that you think uh, direct democracy would be too chaotic and that you're, you know, that's your your kind of your 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 sort of takeaway on that. I, my personal view is I'm, I'm really undecided on this. I, I, I get the the sense, um, you know, I've, I've heard both the arguments and I still can't decide, uh, particularly if, if technology might help to facilitate this. So can, maybe you could expand a little bit before we hear from Paolo on this idea about direct democracy and, and where you think that chaos is coming from and, and, you know, why it might not work or why you're skeptical, perhaps. So my biggest concern has to do with um, social media platforms, algorithms. Um, promoting more divisive or more drama inducing context and content because if that's what gets more likes and more reactions from, from people. Um, this is why I'm worried that with the rise of social media, if that were a, a way to regulate direct democracy, then we actually end up promoting more divisive um, ideas. Very clear. You you kind of froze a little bit there, but I think we all got um, what you were what you were saying. Okay, I think that's a really interesting point. This is great. Okay, Paolo, like uh, let's let's bring you in here as well. Uh, if you could introduce yourself, and then again, uh, you know, what is what do you think democracy should look like in the twenty first century? Okay. Well, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Paolo Borgoni. I'm originally from Italy. Uh, but I've been living now in Portugal for almost seven years. And um, well, I, as I do not represent my, uh, the ideas and the views of an association or organization I work for, as Cleopatra said for herself, um, my position now is uh, in, a, um, in an AIDS committee within the municipality of Lisbon. So basically the city council decided to adhere to an international, bigger, wider network that's called Fast Track Cities. And this means that cities adhering to the program kind of commit to end new infections of HIV by 2030 locally, so at a municipal level, by implementing strategies of response to HIV AIDS epidemic according to guidelines and goals set by UNAIDS, so the AIDS Department of the United Nations. Um, I, I thought it was important to refer to, to my job because this also gives you uh, an idea of what my insight can be from which perspective I come from. 
So when he talks, when we talk about democracy and what it should look like, uh, of course, uh, most of the insights I can give are about health politics related to civil society. So what means to be a civil society activist and worker within um, a very divided um, European um, health politic, because you know um, a, a lot can be thought about um, by sharing practices uh, across borders, but at the same time, every national system works very differently and the values behind and, and strategies behind the national uh, local policies um, are, are very diverse. So it's kind of interesting to, 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 to see it from this perspective. And I think like some of the reflections I've made about what democracy should look like and what Europe should be like uh, also are, have been influenced heavily by the outbreak of COVID crisis that's also exacerbated lots of the issues of marginalizations and access to wealth and other rights uh, throughout the countries we live in. And so it's also sparked the light on privilege, oppression and access. So therefore what Cleopatra also said was very interesting about being divisive with technology and what you also, Joe, added to it. Like, okay, technology can be a very powerful tool of connection uh, around, uh, between people and so, a way of building and collecting collective intelligence. That's that's very true. At the same time, whenever I think of technology, I also think who can access this technology and at what cost and how do we guarantee that people access it uh, equally, but not also accessing equally, but also having uh, being provided with the tools to interpret what comes from connection properly. Because, you know, we've been seeing uh, Bolsonaro <laughs> going up for fake news. So, I mean, what we need, really need to uh, focus when, when we think about implementing more technology to help democracy be more direct and more participated is also how can we make sure that the quality and the awareness of this participation is actually real? Uh, how, how can we be empowered as citizens to the point of being able to divide what's reliable and what's not and what we should base our politics opinion on because that's really tricky and I think that like implementing even more technology can go down the hill with this social media misinformation. I've been seeing this rise a lot, especially in Italy during COVID pandemic, like a lot of mistrust to science was kind of fueled through the networks and that's been very dangerous. And then at the same time, there was another issue that was how the reaction to a systemic disaster like, <laughs> like a pandemic uh, it's actually uh, um, how does this legitimate authoritarian decision on people's lives and their privacy and their routines and you know their the freedom to move around and to to be to to choose for themselves which kind of risk they want to take. I think a lot of things are interconnected in this discourse and seeing it from a health perspective, but as a civil society member, uh, I see a lot of these issues coming from like my reflection comes from health but actually it's applicable to then many other fields so i don't know if i answered but probably what it should be like is yes more inclusive but we should be treating the um, concept of inclusive inclusivity uh, at its core like inclusive in which way and which which tools for everyone yeah, no, you answered beautifully. That was absolutely a really, I think, valuable uh, summation. And 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 uh, I think you 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 bring in the point that Cleop Cleopatra raised as well about information, the quality of information, uh, the risk of disinformation, and then this question of can we have a, a kind of democratic democratic dialogue and negotiation and and kind of engage if we're almost living in if we don't agree on the terms of the debate, if we don't agree on the kind of the, the common, you know, the facts, if, if, if we have perhaps alternative facts, um, how can we have a discussion around that? Is that possible? And I think these are really key questions. Um, I, and, and also, uh, you know, brings us back to Martin's point as well of, of real, how can you ensure real engagement rather than what is increasingly being called democracy washing, where you're sort of you know, saying, oh, this is going to rescue democracy, it's inclusive, it'll, you know, uh, uh, avoid some of the challenges, which everyone has just very nicely kind of articulated now. Uh, but in reality, it's perhaps not doing that. Um, I have a 
bunch of questions, but actually what I want is you guys to come up with the questions and you have. Um, so perhaps I'll just give you a space to kind of anyone who wants to come in and maybe come up with some responses to something they've heard now. Um, you can either just jump in or you can raise your hand however you'd like to. Um, otherwise, if not, I have kind of some questions that I can I can put to you. But but does anyone want to come back on on anything that's been said so far? Does it has it raised any kind of thoughts in anyone's minds? And and importantly, any any suggestions, any answers, any kind of like ways to to meet some of the challenges that we've just talked about. Martin, do you want to? I see you. I don't know if, I, if I'm picking on you, but do you want to give it a shot? <laughs> and not to put you on the spot, these are huge questions. So I'm not saying you have to solve it, but what's going on? What are your kind of reactions to what uh, Cleopatra and Paolo have just said? Yeah, perhaps just to, to follow up on what, what Cleopatra said about social movements. Um, I mean, insofar as we can speak about sort of uh, social progress, um, Sometimes I'd like to ask this question. Do you feel like in the history of humanity as a whole, uh, has there been sort of some kind of net progress or has there been some net regress? And I think a lot of people are inclined to say, well, there has been progress in many ways, so it's still positive. But if you'd ask me, things like climate change <laughs> just shows that, no, actually, we've been ruining this planet and each other. Um, and the fact that there are some other, yes, there are certain... If you zoom in on certain parts, we see some, some types of progress. And I don't want to say that that's not real progress. But all in all, I think we have a lot of uh, reason to reflect on, on, on uh, what progress really means. But insofar as we had progress, and that's where I wanted to connect to Cleopatra, I think it has been social movements driving this, pro uh, this progress. It's not been political parties. I would also not say it by th that it's... Um, sort of democratic innovations per se. It's social movements that, of course, also fought for the, the, the extension of the right to vote, for example. So that's, uh, for example, also women have the right to vote, things like that. Um, so I think also any answer to, the, to this question of the, the future of democracy should, in a way, start from, from social movements, I, I would say, and, and think, okay, how can we sort of how can the energy of social movements be kept <laughs> inside a political system in a way? Um, and there have been various actors also in Greece. I mean, uh, Syriza in a way is, can be traced back right to the Syntagma Square protests. But as far as I can tell, also they, th th there's a disconnect there again. <laughs> uh, and in, I think they have probably um, uh, disappointed many, many people that initially believed in that type of progress that then Syriza would put in practice in the political system. Sorry, it's that, just some food for thought, perhaps. No, it's excellent food for thought. And I think um, this question of, of kind of this ref, sort of almost ref, the social reflective question, are we actually making progress or are we not, I think is something a lot of people feel very keenly in the pandemic. Um, they, I think there was a big question mark after the 2008 crisis and then now an even bigger question mark now and I sent you all some kind of some readings some some things that we had um, uh, speak of people that we'd spoken to uh, in the run-up to this about this kind of issue and one of them was David Runciman who's a, a professor of politics at Cambridge University and, and I interviewed him and his big kind of point that he was making was that there are moments of potential change during crisis when it comes to kind of how we think about uh, democratic systems and systems in general. Um, and often these come after, you know, huge, uh, very negative shocks like the First World War or the Great Depression or the Second World War or the oil shock and inflation of the 1970s. And I spoke to him the day that the first COVID-19 case was announced in the UK. He was speaking me from, from, a, from a kind of, um, so we didn't talk about the pandemic, but I, I called him and he was in a cafe and he was like, yeah, this kind of, this, this virus has shown up in Italy, you know, well, who knows what's going to happen. It seems kind of, um, it's, it's interesting. And then we had this kind of conversation, but of course, as Paolo was saying, maybe, you know, this is a moment, one of these moments where we sort of ask, are we making progress or do things need to change where there is a possibility for the kind of mass movements that we've been talking about to kind of affect change. And, and some of that seems to be, to me, to my mind, coming through in the um, this push towards more participatory and deliberative democracy, including with the conference on the future of Europe. Although I know, Martin, you you have your your kind of doubts about that. Um, maybe I can just get 
Cleopatra and Paolo's thoughts on this, uh, and then we can go back to, to Martin and, and, and see what he thinks. But Cleopatra, perhaps I could, could start with you. What are your, if we're, do, do you, are you kind of um, encouraged by things like the Conference on the Future of Europe? I know it was planned before uh, the, the pandemic and it had to, it was delayed, you know, a lot because of the pandemic. And now they've kind of, um, they've, they've, they've gone ahead in a kind of hybrid fashion, some in person, some kind of online and so on. Um, does that, does that seem like a kind of productive, you know, a way through or, 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 uh, or do you, th are you kind of skeptical, you worry it could be kind of democracy washing and it's not really going to be a, a way forward? You know, I I am a big supporter of institutions. I um, I love projects like the European Union, and I want to root for them. I want to be an advocate for them. I want to promote the European way of life as much as possible. So, in response to your question, I would love to say yes, but when I go out to talk with my friends and have debates about things that are happening in our lives or policies that affect us, the Conference of Europe hasn't even come up or in many times, many cases, European policies and policy making deliberations don't really come to day-to-day -to -day conversations. So yes, there is, there are a group of people, there's a group of people that is very interested in, in the Conference of Europe and in how discussions are evolving in the European sphere, but I'm worried that that doesn't really trickle down to everyday citizens. Um, and um, in terms of the Conference of Europe, I've also read some criticisms that it's really saying, oh, you're, you're not really trying to make a change or with 2022 being the year of youth, you're not really trying to listen to young people's voices, you're just pretending that you that you are. And it really worries me because um, back to what Martin said about the climate change issue, um, young people all over Europe and the world in general have been literally screaming about change that needs to happen in terms of climate change. And it seems like there's still not enough political will to make meaningful change. Um, so I would I would love to say yes, but unfortunately, I'm not fully convinced that it's there yet. Okay, no, no, absolutely. No, we, we love critical opinions, we really do. So, so you, that's very, very welcome. Um, Paolo, I think one of the things that struck me was you were talking about almost like a diversity of approaches. You know, you can have lots, you can have some of these instruments like um, deliberative spaces or participatory spaces at the local level. They don't have to be these big, you know, pan-European projects like the Conference on the Future of Europe, you can run a citizens panel or a citizens jury at the local level to decide on health issues, um, uh, or you could do it uh, on, you know, transport, so should we have cycle lanes or, or should we have parking spaces for cars, these kind of questions. Um, do you think that's maybe a way forward, that we, we kind of take uh, maybe the, the, the methodology of citizens assemblies, but you bring them down to the local level? Could that, is that something that this appeals to you? Sorry, it took me a second to activate my microphone. Yeah, no, it, it totally sounds appealing to me. Like, uh, I, I guess it's a kind of system that would work in kind of giving space to the average everyday citizen that belongs to um, a community maybe that has a specificity or a kind of vulnerability or perceived as vulnerable for some reason or affected by some policies more than others. Um, however, um, I think that when it comes to extremely marginalized, we keep on having the issue of how do we empower people first to make sure they can properly represent themselves in such spaces? Because uh, like many, in many, many, many cases I've seen like very good intentions of white middle-class people pretending to represent other vulnerable uh, communities that have no tools to be representing themselves with their own voice. And that's a key issue. Um, but until we don't change so radically the system at the point that everybody has the same chances of being there representing and having their own voice, um, this is not gonna happen. So um, I've seen systems like this relying on this kind of, okay, we'll let it pass the white saviorism once more 
because it's all we've got and maybe in the future things will be better. But then at the root of the problem, things have never been changed because we still don't, do not have representations of so many marginalized communities and the few ones of us who are actually representing some sort of community or group they feel like belong to are actually privileged and had chance to study and access to superior instruction and so many other things that are actually not granted for many. Um, I wonder whether, and now I connect in a very weirdly way to also climate change, um, we could stop relying so much as we've been doing on individual initiative when it comes to change and starting addressing the institutions and real policymakers to change system in a way that reflects on people and is not operated by people. Because I mean, when it comes to climate change and pollution and all, I mean, all the environment issues that are present, of course, each one of us can ethically consume and reduce and blah, blah, blah. But this is never going to be as big as change in a chain of production in a bigger, powerful government in the world. So, I mean, there's never going to be capacity of comparing the effectiveness of the, initi the, the initiative of one compared to the radical change of a system of production and the sharing of goods in the world, like, you know, equality um, at a, also at an economic level. I mean, having a little bit less everyone, it's very utopic, but it's actually maybe the only one thing we can do at this point. That's a fascinating um, observation, and I, I completely agree. I think so. The the two things that I take away: one, so added to this challenge of disinformation, I think you add the challenge of inequality and where people are are entering the debate from. You know, the position that they're starting, and you can't assume that everyone is equal in terms of power, in terms of access to information, access to technology. We've talked about, but. Um, you know, if you're having a debate, it's not just about do we all agree on the information and the facts. It's also is everyone empowered to the same extent? Are they are they able to kind of discuss and engage on equal terms? And if you have inequalities in society, which you've just you know very very kind of um, uh, nicely kind of gone through, then no, <laughs> it seems to be the answer uh, perhaps. And then the second thing, which I think is really key, is where does democracy apply? You know, do we have this very kind of narrow sphere that we say this is where we can legitimately make democratic decisions, but then you can't talk about things like, you know, I mean, often, for example, we seem to have this idea that that for, leave foreign policy decisions or supply chain decisions or economic decisions, they might be outside of the of the realm of kind of democracy or our systems maybe aren't fit for to kind of cope with some of these issues which have would where there's relentless kind of pressure from advancing technology and we vote every four years you know so it, it, it feels like perhaps you can't kind of keep up so maybe this question of yeah i, I don't I, mean, I don't know if i'm articulating it um in a, in a clear way but i think it's a it's really interesting to, to think of i'd like to go back to martin's because we started i think we, we've had a really interesting discussion about the limits of citizens assemblies and this kind of kind of deliberative approaches i realized we didn't really define those for our, our readers because they're or our, our viewers because there, there will hopefully be people watching um so a citizens the idea behind citizens assemblies is um i mean you can do them in lots of different ways you can you can have uh, different approaches but the idea initially was that you would use something called sortition uh which is you where you would randomly select a set of typically a hundred citizens um from a, uh, a, a like a polity, a state, I guess, um, and then you would present them with uh, information, access to experts. You would pay them. This is important, or at least you would give them uh, reimbursal for their time, so that um, so that because otherwise you have issues with people may have you know. Uh, childcare duties, they may have kind of issues in terms of tra transport access to a location, so all these things. So I think the idea is that they are properly compensated for their time. Um, they are given access to, to experts in, in a, a field who are supposed to answer their questions neutrally. They're given access to kind of uh, different representatives of different sides of the debate, and then they deliberate with uh, in a facilitated process and then come up with a set of recommendations or ideas or suggestions collaboratively. That's the kind of idea behind. It's a very nice idea in theory. In practice, it's been applied in lots of different ways, and it doesn't always match 
the kind of the ideal. Uh, but um, Martin, maybe you can come back in because you said at the beginning you were kind of skeptical, you were a bit worried about kind of democracy washing and 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 so on. What do you, what's your kind of takeaway about some of the things that that Cleopatra and Paolo have said, particularly the idea that maybe maybe this there could be something in these approaches at the local level, um, or maybe yeah, just whatever you want to to kind of come back on. Thanks. I can try. <laughs> um yeah perhaps also to link it to this uh, what you previously discussed with paulo you can't assume equality i think this is a big issue um yes uh, with citizens assemblies by compensating people for coming then you to some extent correct for social economic inequalities for example um but um it stops very soon i would say <laughs> and the idea is that uh, once you have people in the room and everyone gets the same speaking time, um, that then, um, and sort of no one uses sort of uh, bad words, <laughs> that then somehow there is equality. Um, and I think we need to realize that the very norms of our society are set. So what we consider normal are set by white, male, um, heterosexual, um, cisgender, people without disabilities and yeah I could go on with a few more uh, items on the list and the, the sad truth is also that when we talk about democracy the so-called sort of um, democracy heroes in, in the, the, the people that we refer to people like Jürgen Habermas uh, James Fishking within the, also the deliberative democracy community um, I mean they're more <laughs> they're all white men uh, and I read them I've, I've, I've been for too long, I've been quite focused on this question of the future of democracy. For too long, I've been just being surrounded by just white people. And we've sort of pretended that this question of democracy is somehow separate to some extent or categorically distinct from other questions of social justice. Because democracy, there we focus on the process in a way. We, the, the fair, the level playing field. And once there's a level play, but the thing is, there's never a level playing field. So you first need everyone, I think, who's wants to make the world a better place in whatever way needs to first be aware of yeah, the extent to which we are also part of the problem and white men even more so than uh, those most marginalized. No, fascinating. And I'm going to go back to your idea of, of progress as well, this kind of question of, of um, are we genuinely making progress? You know, the question mark, which perhaps the pandemic has raised. I've just finished reading a book uh, by David Graeber and David Wengrow called uh, The Dawn of Everything. Um, and they take a very long kind of view of history, looking back 30,000 years at, at cultures around the world. So it's, you know, very much um, looking at both archaeological and anthropological evidence from um, kind of different approaches to, to democracy and, you know, egalitarianism and hierarchies and so on. So I think your point, first of all, are we making progress? I mean, I think they would perhaps say, but maybe in the wrong direction. Um, and then uh, secondly, your, your, your kind of point about how we can you know, rethink democracy and learn from different approaches and so on. I think it's really important um, that to, to, to kind of keep that in mind. And yes, the, the kind of white, straight male approach to democracy is, is you know, what we think of Classically, when we think of democracy, we think of you know Greece and Rome. Those are our kind of go-to places, and maybe we think of some kind of um, city-states in the in the Middle Ages, perhaps maybe Britain. You know, you think of hundreds of years of, of parliamentary democracy, but maybe our terms of reference need to change a bit, um, particularly given the new technologies and the new approaches that might be able to to kind of um, facilitate us doing things differently. This is really interesting. Um, we're kind of coming to the end. Um, there's so much that we've talked about. I want to kind of give another space, you know, just, to, and I know it was very awkward the first time I'm going to do it again. Uh, anyone want to kind of come in with anything? Because I, I, I can ask questions and I can facilitate, but are there any ideas which someone wants to come, kind of come forwards and, and start um, kind of maybe something that they'd like us to pick up on that we haven't mentioned? We've covered a lot and we're going to, at the end of this, turn some of these into, into questions that we'll hopefully get responses to. But does anyone want to kind of add anything to the mix that we haven't maybe talked about an element that we haven't covered or something you'd like us to, to expand on i'll i'll shut up and just anyone can put their hand up and if not i have i have other questions but um but i'll be silent cleopatra go one thing that comes to mind when we um talk about all of these very interesting ideas is that yes i'm i'm hearing you about the whole idea that we've been living in a kind of 
straight white male reality and it's ruled by that but there's still a lot of people out there who don't really recognize that and um, I don't know if this has to do with where I'm located right now or my circle my social circle but I still find it very hard to talk to people about things like feminism or, or LGBTQ plus rights um, because I feel like there's still a lot of people, even young people, who look at me like I'm crazy when I try to talk about um, the fact that we're still living in a patriarchal society. Um, and I think in forums like this, this is maybe something that is not um, highlighted enough, that there's a, a lot of people who are still believing in the more traditional, have a more traditional way of thinking. And we are moving maybe a bit too fast, or I don't know if um, we're moving too slow. Um, this is something that concerns me is that I've seen, I've seemed to have developed some ideas that while I think they're very progressive and they're going to make our society as a whole better and our democracy more strong, there's still a, a lot of people out there who disagree fundamentally with me, who think that I am destroying democracy. I'm um, taking away their right to express their opinion and to disagree with, with things that I take for granted. So um, this is a kind of challenge for, for me moving forward and for, I guess, democracy in the 21st century as well, that there are people out there who are very still traditional, very conservative, and um, this is leading to very polarized societies with little room for communication between them. Um, and this is kind of concerning me. This, I'm so glad that you raised that, Cleopatra. I think that's sort of such an important point. Uh, and um, it's one of the reasons that I personally am a little skeptical of the approach that you brought up about mass movements and uh, what they can add to democracy. Because I think mass movements, I'm, I'm, I love institutions and I love the institutionalization of um, conflict, not violence, but conflict, you know, because I think it's it, it helps us avoid violence. And if you look at mass movements, they work both ways. The Ottawa truck protests that are happening at the moment, for example, are an example of a mass movement from people who are very skeptical about um, the, the direction that, that Canada is going in, for example. Uh, and um, and the, the January the 6th uh, kind of capital riot as well is similar. That's an example of a mass movement, but it spills over the line between Kind of, I think violence, uh, uh, and maybe you're going to all going to hate me for this, and you're going to come <laughs> back at me, which I encourage. I re please shoot me down if you think that I'm that I'm wrong. But the 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 reason why I'm keen on the citizens' assemblies and the more institutionalized approach is because you set rules and you say, you know, it's it's a more controlled environment, and the and the kind of the potential for for violence if there's disagreement to me it seems maybe less than if you have you know mass movements and they meet each other on the street and i say my, you, my background is in conflict mediation uh, i kind of trained in in northern ireland and i was doing kind of facilitative mediation between communities in uh, protestant and and, and um, catholic communities in northern ireland so i've seen you know the 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 risks of of kind of 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 these tribal identities where there's no kind of common ground and people aren't speaking to each other and i had to do uh, i was uh, training with a guy who did shuttle mediation so he they the these two kind of sides of you know communities on either side of a peace wall wouldn't talk to each other directly representatives would never talk to each other directly so they would basically tell this guy, this wonderful guy who I, who I trained with, um, they'd give him a message. Someone was lobbing fireworks over the wall or something. They'd give him a message. He would have to drive around the wall, speak to someone else and say, oh, could you kind of deal with this? And so there was no kind of direct um, discussion. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And that gives me a skepticism of the kind of Un, of the of the absence of institutions right it, and maybe that's because of my background that's why i kind of have this trust for institutions does anyone want to come back on that we're, we're about to wrap up but any kind of last thoughts on 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 what cleopatra said or um i don't know maybe uh i'll i'll pick on you just for final thoughts because we're going to wrap up i think so martin first and then I'll, I'll come to paulo and then we'll 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 finish so martin what are, what are your thoughts i, I saw Paulo just unmuting so maybe Paolo, then let's let's go to you first, Paolo. Well, no, I just uh, go first. It's okay. I was just still. 
Okay, um, I, I will try. Um, final thoughts. Um, just for, for, for the record, I'm not necessarily opposed to citizens' assemblies. I mean, I'm in a way even sort of arguing for them and sort of campaigning for a more inclusive, I mean, I am campaigning for a more inclusive conference on the future of Europe, for more inclusive citizens' assemblies. I'm doubtful even about the term citizens' assemblies because, yes, not everyone has official citizenship, for example. Uh, so I think we do also need to be very self-critical when it comes to the language that we use, um, the people that we invite to the table. And um, yes, I'm not necessarily opposed, but I do think uh, there's a lot of need for sort of self-reflection and, and learning, individual learning about privileges also within the so-called democracy community, um, also the European democracy community. And I think it should start from there. And I think we should recognize that um, now, yeah, I strongly believe that in order for so-called democracy to work, we really need to put sort of those most marginalized in a way at the center, in a way to, to outbalance the fact that norms in society are already set by, a, by white male people. It is really needed for people like myself to just take a step back um, and for others to be truly at the center. Um, so let me mute myself at this point. Paolo, final thoughts. Uh, sorry, I had to, you know, wrap up my thoughts before I could speak about them. Um, yeah, I, 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 I wanted to go back to the thing of the, the, the thing you mentioned about the capacity of controlling the environment of a smaller discussion rather than two mass movements who won't talk to each other in the street. But um, the image of the two mass movements in the street made me thought made me think, uh, is there any way we can make sure that policy making actually incorporates the issues and struggles of the mass movements before they get to the street. Because it's not by representing them in smaller numbers when they are already in the street that we're actually addressing the problem. Because if we had addressed the problem, those masses of people wouldn't be there. And when it comes to my mind that some of the movements have been a lot, like Me Too uh, was mentioned before, and I thought a lot of how it worked you know, and in terms of social media, the newspapers and all, all the media parts. And what I thought is, um, is there any way that policymakers and, you know, politics in general, so institutions can foster uh, a, a wider, more open, um, a, you know, a, do a cultural work to change mentalities before we get to making decisions about politics? Because um, the concern that Cleopatra raised was, I assume, I take some things for granted, like feminism, but how many people around me do actually do the same? And so I, I think the level of this discourse is really not, not equal for everyone and not even just far, but very far from being equal for everyone, from being access to everyone like actively. And I, I ask myself, and I don't have an, an answer to this, is there any way that institutions can foster this discussion, like legitimate it a little bit more, not letting it be just something online that people argue about without having an informed opinion, but maybe, you know, media at an institutional level could host discussions with experts and people and opinions and blah, blah, blah. And this is not done enough. Uh, I don't know if it's a solution to the problem, but it's just, you know, thoughts I'm having about how we actually process the information and the claims that come from movements, how do we address their origins and how do we act as cultural changers before the policy making? Because the policy making is informed by the culture that is behind. And if it's so everything's so polarized and divided, and we do not get to have a common ground of discussion where people feel entitled to have an opinion, but also feel the, uh, the need of having this opinion backed up properly. I mean, if we don't build this kind of trustful environment of sharing before, how do we get to make policies that can change things? That's my question that doesn't have an answer. That is brilliant, Paolo. That's perfect. That's your question. We can, we can, let's, after we'll stay, please stay on the line, everyone, uh, when, I, when we fin wrap up and, and we'll kind of um, work with you on your questions so that we can get them recorded and, and sent over to the uh, expert panel, which we're holding on the, um, uh, we're going to publish on the 1st of March, which is going to hopefully include some responses 
to your questions and to your suggestions and ideas. As I said, we've got a panel of um, experts who are working in the field of deliberative and participatory, participatory democracy. So this is absolutely perfect. Uh, okay, that was fascinating. That was a really kind of, I thought, productive um, kind of discussion. We talked about so much. Uh, we covered a lot. Uh, I'm going to um, uh, sign off now. So we'll say goodbye to our, our, our viewers. Uh, and then we will continue the discussion. We're just going to kind of um, work on your on your questions, put those together, and then uh, hopefully we'll get a response on the 1st of March. So thank you, everyone. And thank you for watching.